started off as a young artist. At a certain point, Marcel Duchamp was everything to me. And uh, I thought everything was based on uh, Marcel. But eventually in my life, I have to say that the presence of Picasso became greater and greater. And uh, meeting Ernst and over a period of time also understanding just the involvement of, with Picasso. And, uh, to me, the Weiler Foundation is such a fantastic uh, platform of modernism and the views of Picasso. But uh, it's meaningful to me that my art can be here in a place like the Weiler Foundation where intuitive aspects of uh, modernism have really been highlighted. Uh, firmly. So I, I really see a, a lot of my work really uh, paralleling this uh, intuitive form, which I think Picasso represents uh, as objective art. And when I state that, when in this exhibition, when we go into the new, uh, I was always a painter. Uh, Theodore and Sam talked about a dialogue with painting, but I was a painter. I grew up taking art lessons as a child and I learned how to work with uh, pastels, and I took lessons from the age of seven. And I went to art school. I always studied painting. But it, it wasn't until after I finished uh, art school, and I felt like I had already learned how to develop a sense of personal iconography. And uh, personal iconography is uh, learning to develop the tools to uh, be able to communicate within yourself and also to others to manipulate the way you feel, get kind of certain chemical responses uh, going from your body. And uh, I felt that I kind of achieved that. And the last place that I wanted to be was just dealing with the vocabulary within myself about uh, what I dreamt the night before. Or I wanted to go outside myself. And so this kind of discovery, which I believe uh, having a relation to surrealism and Dada and uh, I guess even the philosophy I was reading and Nietzsche and Kierkegaard, Sartre, really set me up that I wanted uh, something other than just self-discovery, but I did learn to trust in myself. And to me, uh, what objective art is, is uh, leaving kind of this internal life and going outward. And this process really is a process of acceptance. that they are stronger. 
And it was finally like art is winning out over life's energy because it's always trying to emulate, it becomes life's energy. And this type of emotional reaction of intensity uh, was playing with that. But, you know, of course, uh, that doesn't happen. Uh, time is with us, and uh, these objects aren't uh, eternal. Uh, I go on, actually, after the new, and I do the Equilibrium series, which is another ultimate state of being of equilibrium. And I have a basketball just hover in an equilibrium, in a, in a aquarium tank, but it's in a state of equilibrium. And, but that also isn't obtainable. Eventually, uh, the ball goes to the bottom of the tank. But I think that there's uh, this honesty that uh, is revealed in this exhibition. It's even for myself to uh, experience that, uh, you know, philosophically, uh, it's a state. It's not a, a true state in uh, reality. Uh, I went on from the new, uh, wanting to always not to have horizontal development as an artist. I always have loved the idea of the avant-garde and people that represented that from the time of like Corbet as like the father of the avant-garde and people like Dali and Duchamp, Picasso, Maccabia, you know, it was the belief that, you know, you create your reality, that art can create these realities and that we're going somewhere together, you experience this like social movement together. And so, uh, you know, I would go on and I created a body of work uh, called Banality. And what I've always have, uh, tried to do is just to trust in myself and follow my own interests. And when you do that, it ends up taking to, you to very metaphysical places. And uh, when I did Banality, I would just look at the world around me and I would see the advertising, I would see the things that we responded to, and I would think about the power of art. If you think back in the 70s, art was really, in a way, uh, disempowered. You had uh, minimalism, you had a lot of different forms of art that were not really embracing the tools of communication. If you would uh, manipulate in a room of artists that you want to make something to manipulate people's emotions, to control their emotions, it would be like, you know, how dare you, you know, manipulate? Uh, how dare you try to control people? And so, but I wanted to bring back and re-embrace the tools of art that's about communication. And of course, to try to communicate to people, you have a responsibility to kind of take control of the dialogue and the discourse to be able to get ideas to, uh, to be able to flow and uh, to have this dialogue. And, but banality also tried to show the responsibility that goes along with that. My first day of art school, when I was 17, I remember getting off the bus at uh, initiation into the school. We went to the Baltimore Museum of Art to see the Cone Sisters collection. And uh, the, uh, the collection is known for Matisse and uh, for Brock and uh, Picasso. Uh, but I didn't, you know, I knew Picasso, but I didn't know Matisse's work. I didn't know Brock. I didn't know Cezanne. And I feel like I survived that moment. But most people don't. And in life, not just in art and following art, but in life in so many areas, People don't survive moments where they're disempowered. I remember when I was maybe about nine years old, I wanted to play football, American football. And uh, in my family, uh, my father really didn't play sports with me. But I wanted to play football, and I went to try out for the team, and everybody already knew how to play. And so I wasn't able to get on the team because it was just too much for me to ever catch up with everybody. And it was. I could have experienced that same thing at uh, go visiting the museum, but somehow I survived that moment. And I've always have tried to create works that embrace people. And the first thing that it communicates to the viewer is that they are perfect. That absolutely everything about you, everybody, is perfect. And it's all about from this moment forward. 
when we experience art, what we're experiencing is our own potential as a human being. That's art. That's the excitement, the, the essence of our own expansion of possibilities. And it's whatever our interests are. Uh, the objects upstairs of my work, they're empty. I mean, they are, they are transponders. When I say they're empty, I put a lot of thought into them, and I think they do their jobs very well, but there's no art in them. They're transponders. The art is in the viewer. I, so in a, in a body of work like Banality, I was trying to communicate to people that your own history, your own foundation to this moment is perfect. And so working with everyday objects, it's to embrace about removing judgments, that uh, it's about acceptance. And I really believe in, in the removal of all ju uh, judgments, the acceptance of everything. I think that there's different levels of significance that we may find with different things at different moments in our lives. But that doesn't mean that objects that at that particular moment we may not find as significant to us as at another moment. It doesn't mean that they are any less relevant to something that we may find more significance at that time. So banality was trying to just embrace the everyday to uh, direct itself somewhat to the concept of guilt and shame that we have about ourselves as human beings and to communicate the viewer to, to overcome that, to have acceptance of themselves and acceptance of their environment, that everything is here for you, in play for you, and for your own use and uh, ability to uh, increase your parameters. Um, from that body of work, I went on and I continued to make art, and I went on to celebration. And celebration, I think, also deals with aspects of kind of industrial things that are uh, made, pre-made, <clears throat> and also, <clears throat> pardon me, um, deals with the aspect that we are the ready-made. Uh, the Banality series was embracing that. Even though these things look like ready-made objects, they're not specifically uh, ready-made. They may make reference to things but that it's about our internal life, that we are the ready-made, that the art's about our internal life. And so celebration absorbs both this kind of aspect of the external uh, ready-made and the desire and, uh, to connect with the outside world, this inside, outside being uh, equalized. And at, at the same time, it's making a greater recognition of human history and a desire to uh, be involved with uh, archetypal images. Uh, you know, if I think of a piece like Balloon Dog, you know, the, the Balloon Dog is uh, it's a beautiful object. The first thing that it wants to do is to affirm your existence. Uh, the reason I work with reflective materials uh, is because it automatically it affirms the viewer. And uh, if you take an object that's completely reflective and you put it in a dark room, you can't see anything. It just reflects its environment. And uh, but so when you uh, walk in front of an object, it is reflecting you and affirming your existence. If you move, the abstraction changes. So it's constantly affirming the viewer and the importance of your existence. Uh, a piece like the Balloon Dog, uh, even though uh, its name is uh, as a dog, but there's an aquarium, uh, probably an equestrian aspect to it. Uh, it's also like a Trojan horse, and it has kind of this mythic aspect and kind of a darker interior also uh, to it than just this external, uh, shiny uh, uh, surface. In the last part of the exhibition, I show some hybrids that deal with uh, different aspects of my work over the years. Uh, one uh, piece that there is swan, and the swan I think of is a very almost paleolithic sculpture. It's very totem. Uh, when I first 
had the idea for the, the, the work and I, I eventually blew up a balloon and I had it scanned. When I received the scanned data, I really had an epiphany because I, I just saw this frontal totem and uh, it was like this phallic sculpture from uh, you know, 50,000 BC or something. So, uh, but what's so uh, wonderful about the piece and what I'm so excited about is that yes, you can come upon it and it can have this aspect of what it means to be human, what's important to be human, and you can start to walk around it and you'll go from this position of almost a male perspective to a sexual harmony where the piece is both masculine and feminine. If you continue to walk around to the back of the piece, it presents itself as almost totally feminine uh, sculpture. And it continues this, uh, this discourse and uh, communication with um, with a human uh, vocabulary, archetypal uh, vocabulary. My uh, most recent kind of beliefs, which started in the celebration uh, body of work, I don't have this object here, but <clears throat> in a work that I did called Diamond. Uh, Diamond uh, is a large, faceted steel piece that looks like a, a diamond. It's about seven foot square. And there are four posts on the side of it. And uh, this work has always reminded me of the moment of creation and that those posts are symbol of male energy and that what's happening at that moment of all the facets of life are unfolding. And if you go back to the furthest point of the diamond, that that's as far back as you could go in human history. And that's our true narrative, our biological narrative. And I mean, I really believe that is the only narrative, but that art tries to emulate that. Any form of consciousness does, does, but art shows so clearly, and artists make reference to different things. And the more connections that you can make to something, the more you're absolutely uh, imitating life's power. And that art, though, eventually, I believe, can make enough connections that it influences the biological narrative. And that's really what a piece like Swan is trying to have a discourse with. And uh, I think it's almost an emotional type of feeling that you can have. Um, you're one of the most famous artists alive. And I was wondering, um, what's the impact of this on your work? I always wanted to participate. And when I mentioned about this kind of concept of the avant-garde, uh, I'm here today, and I'm really grateful to be here. Um, the platform couldn't be better. But it's because I always wanted to participate. And I wanted to be able to uh, have my work be able to be in a, a, a platform to uh, be involved in the dialogue of art. So, uh, as far as having any uh, form of success, that's really the kind of the reward, in a way, the excitement, the, the engagement, the transcendence that I've been able to have within my own life, the dialogue of my own possibility as an artist. Um, these are the, the, the rewards that uh, are so uh, fantastic and wonderful and um, I guess in a way living the life that I always wanted to to do. This has always been the pleasure that I've enjoyed. Uh, not only the physical, emotional experience of uh, creating and having transcendence in my life, but also to try to share that in kind of a moral way within my community. Uh, at a certain point, you want to be able to share and to communicate with people your understandings of possibility. Uh, I was asked if uh, the, uh, I've been quoted or, or something having finding significance in fame, but I, I don't really think so. I mean, I may have, at certain times in my life, when I was younger, uh, made reference that I felt that artists had to compete within the world to try to have their voices uh, communicated. 
again, it was about using the tools of communication. But I don't believe in fame for fame's sake. I don't believe in distribution for distribution's sake. I believe in idea. And uh, through idea, you can communicate and you can touch people and it can affect the world. What makes you an artist is the execution of idea. If I think about uh, an art, it always comes back to making the gesture or having the freedom to make the gesture. I know that within my life, what I would like to do is to experience to the highest level the, the freedom that you can have, the possibility of freedom in human life to make a gesture, the clarity of the possibility of gesture. When you had the breakup with Cicciolina, you uh, destroyed some of the pieces of the In Heaven series. And I would like to know how you feel about it today. And would you say that it's fair that uh, their insight in the concept is the idea of the artist as a star and that you're playing with the idea of fame? Um, the Made in Heaven series, there are uh, many pieces in that series that I'm really very proud of. I think that uh, some of these pieces have a beautiful dialogue with Corbet's origin of the world. And I was really trying to have a dialogue about self-acceptance. Now, a lot of people distance themselves from acceptance because of their own body. They feel insecure. They don't have a, a relationship with what it means to be human and to be, uh, uh, in a way, a, a sexual uh, a being. But I destroyed the work only because uh, it was being used at times as something that could have uh, affected uh, kind of custody uh, rulings. Uh, not for any reason that I did not believe in those works, but uh, my main objective was to try to uh, have a positive outcome for uh, my son. But I've always uh, supported the uh, debate and heaven work. And the fame thing, is it inside the concept? Uh, when I made the body of work, I originally was asked by the Whitney Museum of American Art to participate in an exhibition called Image World. And they asked me to create an artwork that would be on billboard, billboards around New York City. And I just finished my banality show, and in the sculpture upstairs called Fate to Bear, there's a woman lying in the snow like this, and she has a dress on. It's a knit dress. Uh, that dress was inspired by a photograph that I, the first photograph I saw of my ex-wife leaving a party at Andrea Alti's house in, in Italy. And so I thought, oh, that's an interesting dress that the woman's wearing, so I put it in the sculpture. But eventually, after uh, seeing more images of my ex-wife, I used some of her skin tones for some of the uh, uh, artisans to be able to know how to make pieces like Woman in the Tub. But in Image World, they asked me to make a, a piece that was about the media. And I thought, well, I just had success in the art world with uh, my banality show. In American culture, you're not really viewed as a participant in culture unless you're really involved in film or in music. So I decided, oh, I'll make myself like a film star. So I'll, I'll hire that woman, that politician, uh, a person involved in pornography from Italy, and I'll be like, I made a movie, and I'll call it Made in Heaven, starring Jeff Koons and Chi Chi So it was a play on trying to participate within American culture uh, on a level that would feel like a sense of relevance. Uh, in European culture, it's very different. Artists are embraced for being involved in the plastic arts. You don't have to be involved in film or music. Why don't you think that uh, art should sometimes refuse the world uh, as it is? Uh, I think that there's aspects of negation that can also take place with acceptance. Uh, and, and the way that happens, it's just, again, it has to do with what you want to put in play at that moment. But that doesn't mean that everything's not accessible to you. 
But if you make judgments about things, it's 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 distant, distancing oneself from actually using it instead of keeping it in play. So I would just go to that that yes, there can be form of negation just by what you focus on, and focusing on your interests uh, isn't no uh, making judgments or uh, distancing oneself from the possibility of using something, keeping everything in play. The hardest thing to do in life is to keep everything in play. It takes a lot of energy. Uh, you can only do it for a couple minutes at a time. Is it important for you the image that the, the customer have of you? Um, don't you have the feeling sometimes to be more a value than an artist without being me, of course? You know, I have to believe that people don't want to part with their money and that they're quite wise, and they think about things, especially when millions of dollars are involved. And when people do acquire my work, I hope that it's for the opposite reasons, that they have emotionally felt something, they've felt uh, uh, moved by uh, something, invigorated uh, by something, and that they could understand, hopefully, that it has some social value past even the, the moment of interest that uh, they may have experienced. But the idea that the art world or aspects of it are just these large areas of trading taking place and perception of somebody and people buy into it, uh, it's, it's possible maybe to have a train pull a couple cars at the end, but that's not the issue. And uh, the engine really knows its course, knows its power, and it's very uh, aware of the environment. And, and I think the art world's that way. And I think that people that are participating in it, you can hear the great thought that Sam gives about the relevance of things that he looks at in this world, aside from my work. And St. Theodore, you can trust that the relevance that they give to thought about things outside of the realm of my work. And I think that uh, that's the reality of the art world, that uh, the, the participation is by people that are really committed and uh, really dedicated their lives to uh, these investigations and vocabularies. And that this aspect of, of money and everything is kind of on the fringe ends and surface. And, uh, people uh, don't part so easily with their money. You know, by the way, I'd like to just add to that. It's much more exciting to feel something invigorating than any amount of money. I mean, that's how we got involved in art. I mean, the emotional charges, the chemical releases, I mean, wow. You know, that's what it's about. This will, this will buy me dinner for two when I'm old and uh, poor. Thanks a lot, great. Thank you.